till sound and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved on earth shall gather to on the other shore. And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. Oh, and the chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the sky, and the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there. Oh, and the roll is called up yonder when the roll. Is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder. Oh, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. All his wondrous love and care. Oh, then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done. And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Oh, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, oh, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Prayer for Mark Smith. Pray for us if you would. seated. Certainly good to see each of you here once again this evening for our, our evening worship service and I uh, trust you had a good afternoon. As far as announcements go, uh, ladies, don't forget your Bible study this week, uh, January the 12th. That's Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. and That's at Brother Mark and Miss Joni's home and uh, good to see Miss Joni here tonight. Uh, Brother Mark is a driving machine. Now, you knew that. He's a machine in a lot of ways, but he's a driving machine as well. And let me tell you what Brother Mark and Miss Joni have done today. He got up real early and drove to LaGrange, Texas. I don't know how far that is. A couple hours to LaGrange. Brother Mark preached at a little church this morning, and I don't, I'm not belittling this. I'm just really building up Brother Mark, I guess you would say. And he, he'll do good to get his money, his gas expenses from this morning. And he drove all the way back here to drop Miss Joni off so she could be here tonight with us. And he's headed to Victoria and preached in Victoria tonight. He'll come on after the service. And uh, anyways, good to see Miss Joni here tonight. That, that reminded me, I spoke to him this afternoon a couple of times. And he was on the road. And he's going to be on the road all day preaching two churches today. So uh, you pray for him as he travels and as he preaches tonight uh, there in Victoria. But ladies, your Bible study is January the 12th, this Tuesday night. Our Bible conference is coming up. Or uh, I think Brother Mark calls that the New Year's Bible Conference. And as it starts next Sunday, Living Proof will be here in the morning service, or I guess all day next Sunday. And, uh, and then my Uncle Ronnie will be here as well, Sunday through Wednesday night. So keep that in mind, and uh, we'll look forward to that. At time, it's always a, a sort of a highlight of the year. Brother Mark will moderate that meeting. And uh, so you come, be in your place. We'll take up a love offering each, uh, each service. Uh, to uh, be a blessing to our guests, so be prepared for that as well. All right, I don't know of any other announcements right now that are pressing. Um, I think of something I'll get with you in just a second. Let's sing some more, Brother Ken. Take a page five, oh, that'll be glory. Go ahead and stand with me. Page 539, all three verses. Page 539. 
That way get you, get you warm. Get you warmed up in here. Stand up so you can sing good. When all my labors and trials are o'er And I am safe on that beautiful shore Just to be near the dear Lord I adore Will through the ages be glory for me Oh, that will be glory for me Glory for me the glory for me, oh, when by His grace I shall look on His face, that will be glory, be glory for me. When by the gift of His infinite grace I am accorded in heaven a place, just to be there and to look on his face will through the ages be glory for me. Oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me. Oh, and by his grace I shall look on his face. That will be glory, be glory for me. Friends will be there I have long, long ago. Joy like a river around me will flow. Yet just a smile from my Savior I know will through the ages be glory for me. Oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, the glory for me. Oh, and by His grace I shall look on His face. That will be glory, be glory for me. One more, page 549, face to face. All four verses of page 549, 549. <clears throat> face to face with Christ my Savior, a face to face, what will it be? Oh, when with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me face to face I shall behold him for me on the starry sky face to face in all his glory I shall see him by and by I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky, face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by, what rejoicing in his presence, when and pain when the crooked ways are straightened and the dark things shall be plain face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky face to face in all his glory I shall see him by and by face to face oh blissful moment 
face to face to see and know. Face to face with my Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who loves me so. Face to face I shall behold Him far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all His glory I shall see Him by and by. It's good singing night. You can be seated. Sister Tracy has our special. the 
Tracy, Miss Joanne, love to hear Miss Tracy sing that song. It's a blessing. Daniel chapter six this evening. The book of Daniel, the sixth chapter. It's right after the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament. You know, there's uh, something that we all have in common, an experience that took place in our life that took place in all of our lives, and we uh, probably don't remember when it happened, but I can assure you when it did happen, all of us were absolutely fascinated by it, and it was the time we first saw ourselves in a mirror. We were startled, we were shocked, we were confused. <laughs> Who is this person looking back at me? That kind of thought probably crossed our head. And what made the mirror really fascinating was when it finally dawned on us, that's me. I'm looking at me. I'm, I'm looking at myself. This is what I look like. Some were happy about that. Some weren't so happy about that. But the mirror has, uh, since that first look in the mirror, has become, I guess you would say, more uh, important, more increasingly important throughout the years, whether you're uh, getting ready to go to school, you're about to walk out the door to go to school, or you're about to go to work, or you're about to go on a date, or you're about to get married, whatever the case may be, there's one thing that we make sure we do before we leave the house, and that is look in the mirror. And the reason for that is the mirror doesn't lie, does it? The mirror never lies. The mirror shows you what you look like when you have makeup on and what you look like when you don't have makeup on. It shows you, uh, shows us men look like, shows us men what we look like with a face that's clean, cleanly shaved and one that's not. Shows us what we look like when every hair is in place or when every hair is out of place or when you don't have hair to put in place. There's nothing fake about the mirror. There's nothing hidden in a mirror image. Well, I told you this morning that we're going to start uh, just somewhat of a mini series uh, taking a look into a mirror. As I was standing in the back this morning, Jimmy told me I needed to get with the ages and call this, you know, taking a selfie or something like that. And, uh, but we're not talking about physically what you would see if you were to look into a mirror. I'm talking about spiritually. If there was a spiritual mirror, a moral mirror, an ethical mirror, what would you see if you were to look in it? We're going to be talking about perhaps the most important thing tonight that there is about us, and that is our character. Our character. What do you see when you look in the mirror? I don't mean what do you see on the outside, but if your mirror were to reflect you on the inside, what would you see, or perhaps more importantly, what should you see? You know, I think you and I are living in a day, and I think you'll agree with this statement, where people are far more concerned about their reputation than they are their character, and the latter is not always a true reflection of the former. You see, your reputation is what people think you are when they look at you through a window. But your character is what you know you are when you see yourself in the mirror. It's been said that people are like trees. The shadow of the tree is reputation. The fruit of the tree is your personality. But the root of the tree is your character. Abraham Lincoln said it well. He said, character is like a tree and reputation is like its shadow. The shadow is what we think of it. The tree is the real thing. Here's a great question that you and I would do good to ask ourselves this evening. If your reputation was walking down the street and ran into your character, would they recognize each other? Would they know each other? The question is, what makes up good character? And that's really what's going to... Uh, surround, we're going to surround ourselves with this 
this short series is answering that question, what makes up good character? Uh, what would be the character traits that would be true of you if your character wasn't just good, but if your character was godly? What would the character traits be that make that up? What, what would the character traits in your life be of not just what you want to be, but the kind of person God wants you to be? I want to submit to you that the very first trait that needs to be real in your life, the very first thing that people would know about you if you truly have good character would be your integrity, your integrity. I think if we were building a house made out of character, integrity would be the foundation. Because you see, uh, your character is largely going to depend upon your integrity. You've heard the saying many times, I forget who it's original with, perhaps some of you know, but someone said that everything rises and falls on leadership. And I believe that's absolutely true. But may I add to that that leadership rises and falls on integrity? On integrity? In fact, none of the other character traits that you and I can ever discuss really matter if you don't have integrity. Even more to the point, you, don't, you won't have character traits, good character traits that we'll discuss, character traits like honesty and things like that if you don't have integrity. Integrity. Integrity is far more important than fame. Integrity is far more important than a fortune. It's more important than your position at your job. It's more important than the possessions you have. It's more important than, than uh, you being with the in crowd. Friend, what you accomplish will make your name known, but your integrity will determine whether your name is worth knowing. Do you hear what I said? What you accomplish will be what is, makes your name known. But whether or not you have integrity will be, whether or not may, will be that which makes your name worth knowing. And today we're going to study a man who I believe is the epitome of the word integrity. And really it's because of his integrity that we even know who he is. And really it's because of his integrity that he's got a book named after him. His name was Daniel. And anybody familiar with the Bible who thinks of Daniel immediately thinks of the lion's den. That's found in Daniel chapter number 6. We'll read that account here in just a moment. But what's important about this story is not Daniel being thrown into the lion's den, uh, but it's what happened before Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and really why Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. And I think the story of Daniel and his experience before, during, and after the lion's den will really teach us some tremendous truths about integrity, why it's so important for us to be men and women, boys and girls of integrity, why we must have it. Number one, notice as we think about Daniel, I see that Daniel did live a life of integrity. Once again, I'll repeat myself, when we think about Daniel, we automatically go to the story of the lion's den, and rightfully so. It's a, it's a good story, it's full of, uh, of, uh, of action and things like this, it's one that automatically catches our attention. We remember the story from Sunday school, from uh, our earliest stages of being able to remember, uh, but, but the reason that Daniel was thrown into the lion's den is more important than the fact that he was indeed thrown into the lion's den. We often forget what got Daniel in the lion's den to begin with. Notice verse number 1 of Daniel chapter 6. The Bible says it pleased Darius. Now, let me go back just a second. Darius is a, a new king. Matter of fact, if you'll go back to chapter number 5, you'll see that in the last verse it says that Darius, the Median, took the kingdom, being about three score and twenty or three score and two years old. And so he's a new king at this point. Not much time has passed between chapter 5 and chapter 6, if any. Now notice verse number 1 again. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. And so the king of the empire at this time is a pagan, a man by the name of Darius. Evidently, if you'll study the book of Daniel, he suspected that some of the people under him uh, were not keeping their word, were not being faithful to their word, and perhaps even embezzling uh, some of his fortune and some of his money. Uh, the empire was so vast 
that Darius knew that he must surround himself with the best people he could find to ensure uh, honesty and ensure accountability. Uh, he knew that he was no better uh, than the people he surrounded himself with. And by, by the way, that's a real good lesson for you and I to learn, that you will be no better than those that you surround yourself with. And uh, he knew that it was absolutely critical that he find the absolute best men possible to help oversee the different affairs and different things going on throughout the kingdom. Well, there was one choice that was obvious. Notice verse number 3. It says, Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidences and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Now understand, Daniel's not a young man at this time. Matter of fact, historians, Bible scholars tell us that Daniel's around 85 years old at this point in time. He's been serving the Lord in Babylon for over 70 years at this point in time, and he's now under his third king. This is uh, the new kid on the block. It was likely that perhaps Darius had never met Daniel, uh, but though he perhaps didn't know Daniel, he knew Daniel. He knew about him. If you'll read the book of Daniel, you'll know that Daniel's reputation, no doubt, uh, preceded him for seven decades. Daniel has proven himself to be a man of absolute, uh, a man of complete, impeccable integrity. And so Daniel's put in charge of everyone else. He's second in command only to the king himself. Uh, someone said that it's integrity, uh, that integrity is the cream that always rises uh, to the top. Uh, someone said that integrity trumps ability every single time. Friend, there's no limit. Uh, there's no limit to how far someone can go if they know that they can always be trusted to do the right thing. And so Daniel's not promoted because of his uh, seniority, because he's been there 70 years or anything like that. Uh, he's promoted because of his morality. His character was a cut above everybody else, and we'll see that. Uh, as we move on, but we'll also see that it was his character, that it was his integrity that really is what gets him into pretty big trouble. Notice verse number 4 of uh, chapter number 6. It says, the, uh, the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. What a, what a testimony. Uh, what a tremendous testimony. There was evidently uh, this, uh, this good old boy network, if you will, that had been skimming off the top. And those that had been taking advantage of that knew that as long as Daniel was at the top, those days were over with. Uh, they all knew that Daniel was an outsider, that Daniel was a foreigner, that Daniel was an immigrant, that he was a Jew, and they just could not stand the thought of Daniel being over them. And so what they do is they launch this full-scale investigation into his life. Boy, they literally throw the kitchen sink at him. They, they, they put a hound dog on him. They hire private investigators. They bug his telephone. They analyze his tax records. They examine his bank statements. They interviewed people that he went to high school with, that he went to college with. And you know what they found? Nothing. Nada. Zero. Zilch. Whatever you want to say. They brought in the FBI. They brought in the IRS. They brought in the CIA. They ordered them to turn over every rock, uh, uh, search every drawer, search every closet, and they could not find anything on Daniel. I'm sure they thought surely after 70 years of working in the government, there's got to be something. There's got to be something, anything that we can find against Daniel that'll, uh, that'll cut him down to size. But after putting him under the microscope, they found that this was a man who for 70 years had done nothing but be completely honest, had worked hard, and had lived holy. How was the case closed? Well, I, I like their conclusion. Notice verse number 5. It says, Then said these men, these are the men that are searching Daniel, that are, that are investigating Daniel, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of of his God. What a testimony to be able to say about somebody that you're not going to find anything legally on this guy. You're not going to find anything morally on this guy. You're not going to find anything ethically on this guy. Your only hope is to do something spiritually with this guy if you're going to bring him down. And that's what they did. A life 
of integrity. You'll see when you live a life of integrity, a life of character, a life of integrity, uh, life becomes surrounded with a force field of righteousness and goodness that can withstand just about anything, a life of integrity. But notice the cost of integrity in the text. Someone said this, and I thought this was a powerful statement. They said, you are free to exercise integrity, but integrity is never free to exercise. Let me say it again. You're free to exercise integrity, but integrity is never free to exercise. Uh, years ago, I heard someone say, perhaps you've heard this said, if anything counts, it's going to cost. If it doesn't cost, it probably won't count. Uh, if you know the story of Daniel, you'll know that this, this wasn't Daniel's first rodeo when it came to his integrity, but I think it would prove to be the costliest. Notice verse number 6. Let's read a few verses here. Uh, the Bible says, Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute. And to make a firm degree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he'll be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing, that it be not changed according to the law of Medes and Persians, which altereth not. You really got to give these men some credit. It's a brilliant idea. They've searched, they, 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 they've, uh, they've looked for anything morally, anything legally, ethically against Daniel. They've come up empty-handed, and boy, they just checkmated Daniel, didn't they? Uh, since they knew they're not going to find anything against him, they decided, hey, let's make his faith illegal. Uh, let's make his faith illegal. Well, Daniel didn't hide the fact that he prayed three times a day. He didn't hide the fact that he prays to the only God that there is. And so these men know that. It's very obvious in the life of Daniel. They've watched him for perhaps 70 years. And so they pass this law uh, with only Daniel in mind because they know that if they make prayer to Daniel's God illegal, they know that Daniel's going to have a 24-karat gold-plated printed reservation waiting for him to go to the lion's den. How could they be so sure that this plan would work? How did they know that Daniel would would break the law, if you will. Well, it's easy. They knew Daniel. As I said, for, for 70 years, when it came to integrity, Daniel's report card was bar none. It was A+, plus, A+, plus, A+, plus every single time. Every test they, they gave, he graded at 100. They knew that Daniel wouldn't fold. They knew that Daniel would die. They understood how Daniel made every decision in his life. Theodore Hesburgh, who was a former president of the University of Notre Dame, said this, he said, my basic principle is you don't make decisions because they're easy. You don't make them because they're cheap. You don't make them because they're popular. You make them because they're right. And, and though the king thought Daniel had been involved in this decision, if you'll go back to the text, it says uh, uh, they assembled together with the king, said King Darius live forever, all the presidents of the kingdom. And, and so the king thinks Daniel's been involved in making this new law. He hadn't. These men had lied. Daniel knew nothing. But notice verse number 10. It says, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed. In other words, the rubber has just hit the road in Daniel's faith. Boy, isn't that sad? Isn't that a sad thing? He had offered a lifetime of honesty. He had given a lifetime of decency. He had given a lifetime of, of, of godly uh, integrity, godly character, faithfulness to these kings and government service. He had served faithfully. He has served loyally under every king that he's been under. He had always done what was right, always done what was best for others. And at 85 years old, what does he get for it? Does he get a gold Rolex watch? Does he get a new truck? Does he get a new house down the street? Does he get a fat severance package? No. Matter of fact, what he got is he's facing the loss of his position. He's facing the loss of his security, his income, his friends, even his own life. I'll say it again. I'll quote uh, this quote again. Uh, it's not cheap to exercise integrity. Uh, you need to remember this. You and I would do well to remember this, that integrity uh, is not so you can always get what you want to have or go where you want to land, but integrity will get you, who you where you ought to be. Daniel's going to do whatever he can do with his eyes wide open, knowing full well the cost 
that his decisions could bring him. And he came through just like his enemies thought he would. Notice in the latter part of verse number 10, it says he went into his house. His windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Nothing changed in the life of Daniel. Nobody ordered Daniel to pray. And nobody was going to order Daniel not to pray. Now, a simple question for all of us that has to be asked is what would you have done? What would I have done if I would have been Daniel and been in this situation? You know, Daniel had some options, did he not? Daniel could have played it safe and he could have just said, look, I'm just not going to pray for 30 days. He could have closed his windows and prayed in secret. He could have said, I'm going to go on a month-long sabbatical and uh, go somewhere else where nobody's watching me, where nobody knows what I'm doing. He could have laid in bed at night and prayed silently in his head. But you see, integrity doesn't go on vacation, does it? Integrity doesn't take a break. Real integrity doesn't call a time out. It doesn't take a pass. It doesn't bow the knee to anyone but God. It doesn't go with the flow. It doesn't follow the crowd. Integrity will stand its ground. Uh, integrity will, uh, doesn't listen to polls. It lives based upon principles found in this book. And integrity may leave you all alone. Matter of fact, we find out in verse number 13 that Daniel's the only person that gets charged. Notice what the Bible says. Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, <coughs> nor the decree that thou hast signed, but makes, maketh his petition three times a day. He prays three times a day. You know, whenever you're told to stand down, and instead you stand up. You will stand out, and you may stand alone, and you'll probably be a target. You'll probably be a target. Talk is cheap. You know, integrity never just talks the talk. Integrity walks the walk. It never veers off course. Integrity doesn't take the shortcut. It doesn't cut corners. It stands tall, it stands tough, and it stands true to what is right. And that leads to the last thing I want to say about Integrity, not only the cost of integrity, but notice Daniel paying the price of integrity. And so these traitors turn tattletale. They run to King Darius, they present their case. They got what they wanted. They witnessed Daniel not changing anything. So they go to King Darius. Notice verse 11. It says, Then these men assembled, found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king established may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. The king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Isn't that a pretty high price to pay for nothing more than a lifetime of integrity? And now, it's not going to be quick like a lethal injection. His death's not going to be fast like a beheading or that of a firing squad. A lion's den death certainly wouldn't be pretty. Dr. Patterson was with us just a few weeks ago uh, that Saturday night. I got to enjoy a meal with him and, and uh, his uh, associate that came with him, Scott. And uh, Dr. Patterson, as I made aware to you, likes to big game hunt. Years ago, he would go to Africa about once a year, and each time on his trips to Africa, he would try to go on a, a hunt of some kind. You ought to see some of the mounts that he had in his office there at Southwestern and uh, really amazing, the, the animals that he's killed. Now, each time he'd go on a hunt for a couple reasons. Number one, he loves to hunt. Number two, he said that there are multiple orphanages uh, that are owned and operated by the Southern Baptist Convention in Africa, and so each time he would schedule 
a trip to each one and the animals that he would harvest would be used to feed the orphans in the orphanages that he would visit. He's telling me about his lion hunt. He has killed a lion. He said it was the best hunt he's ever been on as far as adrenaline was going. He said as he and his son, uh, his son's name is Armor, uh, he and Armor and their guide was uh, walking through the bush there hunting, looking for a lion. He said they walked about, got about uh, as far from me to Brother Gary from this, this bush, in the bush, and he said they had no knowledge whatsoever that there was a 400-pound uh, lion is hiding behind that bush. He said about the time they got pretty close, that lioness made herself uh, appearing by jumping out and leaping right at Dr. Patterson. He said, luckily, my gun was loaded, had one in the chamber. He said, I pulled my rifle shot, and the lion fell, and he said, the lion's mouth landed on my boot. He said, that's how close I was to, to death. You know, they say that a lion's roar can be heard up to five miles away. I don't know if you've ever went to the zoo and, and heard a lion roar, but boy, I've heard it on TV, and I'm sure if you're there in person, it'll vibrate you, vibrate your whole body. And they say that a lion roars like that because it wants to strike fear immediately into their prey. They don't call him the king of the jungle for nothing. I read that a hungry lion can eat 30% of his body weight in one sitting. That would be like one of us or the average male eating 200 quarter pound hamburgers for lunch. No man is his match, and not even if you saw Tarzan, because the average lion possesses the strength of 15 men. Now, you've got to feel for Daniel. Daniel's thrown in the lion's den with the lion, and you would think after 70 years of faithfulness and, and uh, 70 years of, uh, uh, of or, God, or 85 years of godliness, that this 85-year-old man wouldn't be going out this way. But that may be the price you have to pay for integrity. Because you're never going to outgrow integrity. You're never going to get too old to be a person of integrity, to do that which is right. And Daniel's going to pay the ultimate price, perhaps, if we didn't know the end of the story. You would think he's going to pay the ultimate price of living a life of integrity, of being thrown into the lion's den to face a horrific death. Now, I know what some of you are thinking as I made that statement. You're saying, but wait a minute, Pastor. I've read the book of Daniel. Daniel was delivered from the lion's den. You just got to keep reading. Well, I know that. But I stopped there on purpose. I stopped in verse 16. I want you to imagine that this is where the story stopped. That we didn't have the rest of this chapter. Imagine that this is where it stopped because you need to understand that is a possibility. Not everybody that gets thrown into a lion's den, so to speak, comes out alive. And friend, the only way that you and I will ever maintain our integrity is to make the same decision that Daniel made. And you've got to make it every day, friend. When you get out of bed, that decision's got to be made. Before you go to school, that decision's got to be made. Before you go to work, that decision's got to be made. You've got to make up your mind, and I've got to make up my mind, that our integrity is far more important than our safety. It's far more important than our security. It's far more important than our, our prosperity. It's more important than the position we have at job or that, uh, or that raise we could be potentially getting or our popularity or our fame. Friend, at the end of the day, there's one question that you and I ought to be able to answer 100% in the affirmative every single time, and it's not did I do things right, but rather did I do the right thing. You know, if you'll uh, study the book of Daniel and you'll go 600 years later into the future, you'll find a story that's... Uh, that's very strikingly similar to this one. Notice verse 17. The Bible says, And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and the signet of his lords that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. And so Daniel's thrown into a cave. A stone is rolled across the entrance. Soldiers are, are placed there to guard the cave. The cave is sealed. I'm reminded of another man who faced death like Daniel, except he wasn't thrown into a lion's den. He's nailed to a cross. Friend, Daniel didn't know whether he would live or die, but this man knew he's going to die. We, of course, know that Daniel was delivered from death, but this man would be delivered through death. Daniel didn't die, did he? Uh, Daniel came out alive. This man, 600 years later, died, but he came back alive. Both faced what they faced because of integrity. Technically, if you look at it, Daniel was guilty. Daniel did break the law. But Jesus was guilty because you and I broke the law. 
There's another big difference. Daniel's guilty because he had broken man's law. Jesus was guilty because you and I broke God's law. Jesus had made a promise before he even came to planet earth that he would come and do the will of the Father and do the right thing and die for us so that you and I could live through him and because of his integrity, we can. Yes, there is a cost to consider. Yes, there is a price that must be paid if you're going to be a person of integrity. But I promise you, when you do the cost-benefit analysis, the benefits of a life of integrity far outweigh the cost because when you're a person of integrity, you don't have to fear accusations and you don't have to fear investigations. People can go through your closet and they won't find skeletons. Your life can be an open book if you're a man of integrity, a lady of integrity, because you have nothing to hide. And so I urge you this, this evening, live a life of integrity. Live a life of integrity because, friend, when those times come, when you are put under the microscope, all anybody will see is the light of Jesus Christ, the light of integrity shining in your heart and the fire of purity burning in your soul. You want character? You want godly character? You want to look in the mirror and see what God wants you to see, what you should see? Start with integrity. It is the foundation. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this evening, Integrity. You say, I've got a good reputation. Well, that's good. But does that reputation really represent you? I asked you in my introduction, I'll ask you again. If your reputation and your character were walking down the street and ran into one another, would they recognize each other? Would they know each other? They ought to be twins. They ought to be twins. Identical. And I'll tell you, you may live this life, friend, and you may fool everybody. You may fool your mama and your daddy and your teachers, your pastor, your grandparents, your friends. You may fool your children. You can put on a mask and perhaps you can get by, but there's one you cannot fool, and that is the God of heaven. who only knows your character. You want godly character? I trust that you do. Be a man of integrity. Be a woman of integrity. Do the right thing. Father, bless this invitation. Challenge our hearts. Speak to us this evening. May we be a church filled with men and women and teenagers and boys and girls of integrity. Amen. You got a number.